This is our final class. I know you're very sad because you wanted more classes, right? And this is very light. There's no big equations or theories. This is about glass ceramics. When uh, we, um, well, what's the idea to understand crystallization, nucleation, crystal growth? This is for two purposes. One purpose is to avoid crystallization. If one wants to make a glass, crystal, crystallization has to be avoided. On the other hand, if you desire to produce a glass ceramic, one has to control nucleation crystal growth. And by glass ceramic, I mean you may have an inorganic glass, and then heat treat that glass. If you're very lucky, you end up with a polycrystalline material, and the grains are all inside the material. If these grains are small enough, you end up with a transparent material. This is polycrystalline and transparent because the grain size is much smaller than the wavelength of visible light. These three pieces have exactly the same chemical composition. A glass, an opaque glass ceramic, and a transparent glass ceramic. So, um, the nature overall properties in processing of glass ceramics. All the lectures are available at this um, website here and some other websites also. Today we'll be talking about, of course, we are not talking about high temperature reactions melting and fining and glass forming. This Topics are the subject of previous lectures in other courses that you have taken before. Uh, today, um, we are going to talk about the definition, the properties and applications of glass ceramics, uh, some thermal treatments that are uh, done to induce controlled nucleation growth, normally in the glass interior. One exception here is sintered glass ceramics which rely on surface crystallization. We are going to talk a little bit about sintered glass ceramics. And then uh, I'm going to describe some types of commercial glass ceramics, glass ceramics that are already in the market, and some new and exotic processing techniques. Before I continue, I like to uh, suggest that you read Take a look at this book by uh, Wolfram Hilland and George Pugh. This is one of the most complete books on glass ceramics, glass ceramic technology, the second edition. And also a review paper I wrote a few years ago in the uh, ceramic bulletin uh, about glass ceramics. And there are two other papers on glass ceramics I'm going to suggest to you. Um, one of them, or actually, there's a special issue, brand, brand new special issue on glass ceramics published by the Materials Research Society Bulletin. There are about six or seven papers, brand new papers, 2017, on glass ceramics. They include um, they include an uh, opening paper. Realization of the unobtainable. Property combinations. That's a key issue about glass ceramics. You can combine several properties. And then there are all review papers. One about transparent glass ceramics by Olga Dimishitz and some colleagues. 
She's a very, very well-known author in this field. And then, um, paper on ionic conducting glass ceramics, published by my colleagues here, Professor Anna Candida and Professor Helmut Eckert. This is conducting glass ceramics. And then, ferroelectric glass ceramics, ferroelectric glass ceramics by a group from Portugal. Very interesting paper on nature-inspired microstructures on tough, strong glass ceramics by a Corning group, Chang Fu and some colleagues. <clears throat> Bioactive glass ceramics by Professor Aldo Boccaccini and some colleagues, your experts in this area. And finally, um, glass ceramics for nuclear waste uh, encapsulation or disposal. So these are, these are very recent review papers that if you want to have a good view, macroscopic view on glass ceramics, I really recommend it. And there is also a brand new book, From Glass to Crystal, brand new book, now is an English edition. It has more than 600 pages. It covers several aspects of crystal nucleation, crystal growth, overall crystallization, experimental techniques used in glass ceramics. So, there's lots of good um, references on, on the subject. And there are books. There are books. The glass ceramic technology that I have already mentioned, glasses and glass ceramics for medical applications, a whole book dedicated to this area. Uh, older books, glass ceramic materials, low thermal expansion glass ceramics, in one of the pioneer books by Professor Mark Millen called Glass Ceramics. This is the first book, the first technical book that I ever read about glasses or glass ceramics, this book here. Um, I became really interested in this field after reading the first edition of this book. And in the end, Professor Mark Millen was a member of my PhD committee. When I defended my thesis, he was one of the examiners of my thesis many years ago. Anyway, and there are review articles, of course, uh, by George Pugh and Linda Pinkney, Wolfgang Holland, Wolfgang Pongorst, Peter James, Mark Davis, myself, and, and co-authors, Olga Dimitschitz, and so on. So there are many interesting references on glass ceramics. If you are going to do a thesis or a research project, you should take a look at some. You do not have to read all these references, but at least some of them. And there are references before I forget, and since this is the last class, about the fundamentals of crystal nucleation, crystal growth, overall crystallization. Several books published by uh, Professor Schmelzer in, in Germany, and also very good book by Kelton and Greer in the book that I just mentioned, this uh, From Glass to Crystal, the French edition, if you prefer French, or the English edition, if you prefer English. Okay, um, this is um, I think I have already mentioned um, crystallization, nucleation, crystal growth, glass forming ability are the most frequent, are most, the most frequent keywords used in the so-called glass science and technology field. And this is because you either want to avoid crystallization or induce crystallization to produce a glass ceramic, avoid crystallization to produce a glass. And that's the reason why these keywords are so important in glass science and in glass technology. Um, 
it's interesting to see that one of the very first books published many, many years ago by uh, George Morey in 1938, this is the first edition, 1954, I have a copy of this book in my library. And this is the year I was born, 1954. And he says in the beginning that devitrification is the chief factor which limits the composition range of practical glasses. It's a never present danger in all glass manufacturing and working and takes place readily with any error in composition of technique. In other words, people try their best to avoid to avoid um, crystallization if, if they're going to produce a glass. And George Morey mentions of this problem. So devitrification is <clears throat> used for uncontrolled, for spontaneous crystallization. And there are many cases where uh, glasses devitrify. You don't want them to devitrify in the first phase, but they do. So this is the term used for uncontrolled crystallization. But glass ceramics, well, the first people that tried to produce glass ceramics was a French researcher called Remur. Remur, in 1739, he wanted to produce porcelain by crystallizing glass bottles. He wanted to crystallize glass bottles. So he was heat treating glass bottles, but to his surprise, the glass bottles were, were uh, melting and, and losing their shape before they crystallized. Because the secret of glass ceramics is to induce crystallization in the volume, in the bulk. But if you put a glass bottle in a furnace, they will crystallize from the surface and will sag and deform. So he could not produce a glass ceramic, but he has published his paper uh, with all the details and uh, which were unsuccessful. But the, the real, well, of course, there are natural, there are natural glass ceramics such as obsidian that luckily have some internal nucleating agents. They have so many elements inside that some are nucleating agents and depending on the cooling conditions, uh, they can crystallize. But the discovery of glass ceramics, as we know now, was made by a doctor, Donald Stuckey, in 1953 at Corning. He had some pieces of uh, lithium silicate based glasses, which had some silver nanoparticles inside. He was working on photochromic glasses. And these glasses have silver particles inside. And by accident, the, one of the furnaces overheated to 900 degrees Celsius rather than 600. He just wanted to annul the glass at 600, but it overheated to 900. And then the material crystallized in the bulk because of the silver particles that act as a nucleation, nucleation agent. So he produced the first glass ceramic in 1953 by accident. Of course, he was clever enough to perceive that the material um, did not break when he, he tried to pull the material out of the furnace and the, it, it dropped and did not shatter. So he thought, well, this is a strong material. It's stronger than glass. And well, this is the discovery of glass ceramic, 1953. And this is Dr. Stuckey. I only met him, I met him once, as you can see in his photograph here, in 2006, I met him. Uh, he came to, uh, there's this me. And this is, uh, let me see, Wolfram Holland 
from the book that I mentioned, and this is Dr. George Pio, also a co-author of that famous book on glass ceramics. And uh, this is a TC7. It's a group. It's a group of people who work on on glass crystallization, glass ceramics. It's like a club organized by the International Commission on Glass. Luckily, they're all alive in good shape, except for Dr. Stuckey that passed away two or three years ago. All the others are, are still hanging around and uh, uh, some are retired, but they still work as consultants and, and uh, they work for me as reviewers of the papers of the journal Crystalline Solids and other journals. These are other people um, that uh, you, you hear about them. Uh, you heard about some of these people in my lectures and you're going to hear about them a little bit more today. Anyway, uh, if you look at uh, some statistics about glass ceramics, uh, if you look with the keywords glass ceramic with a dash, or glass ceramic without a dash, because it depends, different authors use different ways, you find about 13,000 articles um, in, in the Scopus database, or 7,000 if you only search in the article titles, because you can do a search in the article title, or in the article title and abstract and keywords. There are two types of search. This kind of search is cleaner than the other one, but you lose some articles. So the, the real number is in between 7,000 and 13 articles already published about this material that was discovered in 19. 53, 64 years ago. Uh, we have published with Maziar Montazerian, who is here attending this class. With Maziar, that young guy over there, we have published uh, two years ago a statistical overview of glass ceramic science and technology in the American Ceramic Society Bulletin, which is really interesting. And uh, you can see in our article the number of papers. This is the number, number of papers versus year of publication. You know, we started in 1953, but the first paper was published in 1957 or so. The, the Dr. Stuckey and, their, and his colleagues at Corning, uh, they spent about four years working more in developing other materials and filing up patents. Only in 1957 or so, they had published the first paper. And then this number is still increasing, as you can see. Searching in the title abstract and keywords, or searching only in the article title. But the number is increasing, increasing, increasing. There are fluctuations, of course, but the overall, if you polish these curves and curve fit some, some mathematical expression here, you see clearly that there's a big increase in the number. So it's still a very interesting material to work with. So let's take a look in some um, exciting new types of glass ceramics and discuss some critical issues regarding air processing and properties. This is the idea of uh, the class today. I'm going to use again the very famous plot, and by now you know very well this plot of any property versus temperature. Liquid, supercool liquid, glass, and okay, we make a glass. And then we heat treat our glass somewhat above TG to induce crystallization in the volume of the material. That's the general path 
to produce a glass ceramic. And if you want to look at more detail, first step, this is temperature versus time, the first step is to melt, get rid of all bubbles to homogenize the material for some time, you produce it homogeneous, melt, then you cool down a little bit and shape the material, produce like a block or a cylinder or whatever shape you want to produce, then nucleate for some time, heat it up, let the, the crystals grow and cool them down, you have a glass ceramic. This is the general kind of recipe to produce a normal glass ceramic. This is another recipe that's produced sintered glass ceramics that I'm going to talk in a minute or so. But, so what's the definition? What's a glass ceramic? The TC7 club or committee that I have already described to you is still debating. They are debating on the final definition of glass ceramics. So this is not the official final definition. This is my own definition of glass ceramic. It might change a little bit, not much, in two or three months when they finish their work. Um, my definition is glass ceramics are polycrystalline materials produced by controlled crystallization of certain inorganic glasses. One can also crystallize polymers or crystallize metallic glasses, but they're not glass ceramics. They're semi-crystalline polymers or semi-crystalline metallic alloys. But glass ceramics refer to inorganic glasses because of the word ceramics. Ceramics refer to inorganic materials. They contain a residual glassy phase, always. Always there is some residual glass. In one or more crystalline phases, can be one, two, sometimes three crystalline phases, depending on the properties that you want, with widely varying crystallinity, between 0.5 and 99.5% crystallinity. So there's no limit for crystallinity. As long as you have a glass phase in some crystalline phase embedded in the glass phase, and you have induced this nano or microstructure on purpose, this can be called a glass ceramic. Frequently, they have between 30, 40, 50, 60 percent, some, something like that, of crystallinity. But I can show you some that has less than 1 percent. In a minute, I'm going to show some examples of glass ceramic. So this is my definition of glass ceramic, not the official definition of the TC7 that we will appear in a few months. They, they are working. They are working on the official definition. And I'm giving some insights also. So what's the advantage of glass ceramics over other ceramics? Well, they can produce very fast. You know that glass forming techniques are very, very fast. You can produce millions of pieces per day. So you can use fast processing techniques. It's very attractive for a material scientist or materials engineer to design, to engineer or design the micro or nanostructure by controlling the chemical composition and the thermal treatment. You know, if you want to produce a nano-sized material, what's the strategy? Nucleate a lot close to the maximum nucleation temperature and grow just a little bit. If in other cases you want a large grain size material, you just nucleate a little bit and let them grow. So you can play games with the nucleation growth curves and also with the chemical composition. You can add nucleating agents more or less. You can uh, make the composition of the matrix close to the composition of the crystal phase that you want. There are several variables that can be controlled. And most have 
very low or zero porosity. This is very difficult to get with ceramic materials. Sintered ceramics almost always, always have residual porosity. Well, glass ceramics don't. You start with a glass, you crystallize the glass, and most times you don't have any porosity. If you're not careful, I should say that, that sometimes there's nucleation of bubbles because some gases are dissolved in the glass. When you start to crystallize, you remember the project we had with a former colleague of yours, right? Uh, uh, the glasses start to crystallize and gas is no longer soluble in the crystal phase. So it precipitates in the crystal glass interface, bubbles precipitate. So that happens sometimes, not always. That's why I write here, most have zero or low porosity. Some end up with porosity, but there are ways to understand and, 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 and minimize the porosity. And finally, it's possible to combine desired properties. This is the whole idea of this special issue here. The first paper that I have written with Mark Davis says that combination of properties, you can combine properties in the way you want. And this is a key issue here. You can combine like high thermal and chemical stability, for instance, with transparency or tougher material with bioactivity. So this is much better than a bioactive glass because you can make it tougher and stronger. Or you can have a zero thermal expansion coefficient with a tougher material or harder material. Combinations of properties are very key to the success, the commercial success of glass ceramics and the interest of glass ceramics. And as I said, as a material scientist, you are able to control the grain size distribution and shape, the texture or not, the porosity, the percentage of crystallinity, the type and number of crystal phases, and so on. In that way, it's possible to um, control all the properties of these materials. Here are some examples. This is uh, Dr. Stuke. He liked very much, I heard from his friends, to fish. He was a fisherman, his hobby, you know. This is Dr. Stuke. And, but you can see like substrates of hard disks. Hard disks in computers, the substrates sometimes are made of glass ceramics. Huge telescopes, mirrors of eight meters in diameter are made of glass ceramics because of zero thermal expansion coefficient. Cooktops, artificial teeth and prothesis and very, very interesting and wide range of, of um, domestic and also high-tech materials. Um, the famous vision, the cooking pans, made of transparent glass ceramics, so you can visualize the cooking process, if you still have water or not, and then they're nice, so you can bring them directly from the oven to your serving table, and very intricate parts, which can be machinable. There are machinable glass ceramics, like, like graphite. Some glass ceramics have mica-type phases, so you can drill holes and machine them and make very, very, very complex shapes by mechanical machining. And these materials are, for instance, good dielectric insulators in heart or, you know, whatever property you want. So there's a number, even, even other types of, no, this is transparent, this is opaque, but there's a lot of 
opaque glass ceramics in the market, you, you don't even know. You think you're dealing with normal ceramic or porcelain, you're dealing with glass ceramics. So from the same paper with Maziar and Shiv, another collaborator of ours in the American Ceramics Society Bulletin, uh, we are showing also the number of patents is also increasing. If you recall in the previous plot, we are showing the number of papers, scientific papers, but this is an area of commercial interest. So this is the number in the year, the number of patents are also increasing. Look at this number here. 5,000 patents have already been granted. This is approved patents. And there are probably a few thousand patents under analysis at the moment. It takes two or three years to analyze a patent. So there are several, several patents being analyzed. Our group here, we have about 20 patents uh, in this field. And uh, I would say more than half of them are still being analyzed in different countries. So it's a, it's a very prolific area because of all the qualities I'm trying to describe to you. The, looking at the companies, this is important because some of you are engineers and you might in the end get a job in the research center, one of these companies. They, they're, all these companies do a lot of research, like shot, and they have companies in, in Germany, they have plants in Germany, in the USA, in Brazil, in, in, even in Rio de Janeiro they have one. Corning, Kyocera, Nippon Electric Glass, Tsais, Bosch, Ohara Glass, Asai Glass, Matsushita, Eurokira, 3M, Fujitsu, Owens Illinois, Hitachi, Matsushita, NGK, Murata, Evo Clar, NEC. Evo Clar makes the, the artificial teeth and prosthetics. And there are several others, several other. We, we have only listed 20 here, but there are maybe 20 or 30 more companies um, working and producing glass ceramics. So keep an eye, you know, in, and this is the number of patents uh, granted to each one of these companies. And other companies, they develop products and prefer not to file patent. They prefer to keep their discoveries as uh, industrial secrets. So you never know. You never know what's the level of activity of different companies. But there are at least 30 or 40 companies. Many now in China that are not listed here. There are many companies in China now working on glass ceramics. Well, this is difficult to read, uh, uh, but uh, the number of granted patents and patent applications uh, with the keywords glass ceramics, per intended use. This is per intended use. So the, the blue, blue means granted. And, and red means still being analyzed in different fields. Look, thermal applications of different types, electrical, electronic, optical, miscellaneous. This is the different production techniques, a dental glass ceramics, mechanical applications of glass ceramics, chemical, architectural, bio, energy, magnetic, armor for ballistic resistance, coatings, refractory, uh, nuclear waste encapsulations in, in many areas. You can see that there are many, 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 many areas of applications of different types of glass ceramics. Still from the same American Ceramic Society Bulletin article. This is just to give you an idea. There, this list is much longer. This will give you an idea of what type of crystal phases 
these people were nucleating, growing their glass ceramics, commercial glass ceramics. So, so this is the fancy, they come up with fancy commercial names, Fotiran, Zero Dur, Ceram, Nextrema, Pyroceram. These are commercial names for marketing purposes. But the most interesting uh, thing here is the phase. Look, lithium silicate, beta quartz solid solution, lithium aluminum silicate, beta spodiumin, barium silicate, cordierite, mica, spinel enstatite, it's just two phases, mica, beta holastonite, and so on. And here is the type of the type of uh, special feature of application. Photosensitive materials, telescope mirrors, cookware, stove tops, cooktops, fireproof windows, fireproof windows for fireplaces, cookingware, photosensitive material, gas turbines and heat exchangers, microwave material for tableware, cookingware, ray dumps, ray dumps for missile noses, machinable materials, magnetic memory disk substrate, dental restoration, magnetic memories, uh, substrates, for architecture, for architecture, cooktops, low thermal expansion materials, color filters, panels, and so on. So, I, I'm, I'm giving all this list because we normally do not perceive how many glass ceramics there are in the market. It's tough to, if you're not a real expert, if you see a material like this, you would not know that this is a glass ceramic. You think, wow, this is a porcelain or some ceramic. Unless you're a real expert, you don't know. Even if you see a transparent glass ceramic, such as this one, you might think, and most people think, oh, this is just another glass. So glass ceramics are more or less invisible. They're invisible. They're inside that uh, lamp projector, they're inside the computer, they're somewhere, or they look like a glass, or they look like a, a normal ceramic. We don't know, but there are many. Not only that, they're high-tech, they're, they, they have a high commercial value. They're expensive materials, you know. It's a lot of technology embedded in glass ceramics. I'm trying to motivate you for this field. It's a very, very interesting, very, very interesting field to work with if you are a materials engineer or scientist. So, uh, how about the glass ceramic processing? Well, the key steps here is to decide about the composition in proper nucleating agents. This is a very difficult step. Like Maziar and Mina are developing a new type of glass ceramic which is intended for perhaps dental use or bioactive use with high toughness. It's very difficult to decide on which composition you are going to work with, which nucleating agents. How many, or how, what's the percentage, or how many types, and what's the percentage of nucleating agent you're going to add? Like Deborah is working with armor glass ceramics. Which phase you want to crystallize? What's the best nucleating agent? What's the, um, uh, this is the, the beginning. And this is hard enough. It needs a lot of experience in the expertise. And then, of course, you have to be able to melt, homogenize, get rid of bubbles and so on. Sometimes they are high alumina content or high zirconia content. They are very hard to melt, to homogenize, like refractory materials. And then you have to decide on a shaping process. Shaping. What's the kind of shape? your final product will have. Is it necessary to annul the glass 
you know that all glasses have, except fibers, have to be annealed to relieve stresses. But glass ceramics will need to be heat treated at some stage for proper nucleation growth. So is it necessary to anneal a glass or not? Sometimes yes, sometimes they do not need to be annealed. And then what type of microstructure you intend for? You want nano-sized crystals with low volume fraction or just a micron-sized crystals or a very high volume fraction? All this is part of the design, what type of properties, what type of the final application. So when you are working on a glass ceramic, you have to think about all these steps together. They are all interrelated, completely interrelated. You know, you cannot just say, and some students do, hey, I want to develop a glass ceramic. Well, why? It's not like that. You have to think upwards. What's the intended application? And then you work all the way from here to here. This is the path from here to here. It takes a long time. We now have enough experience in this lab, but it will take typically three years or so to develop one at laboratory scale. Now, upscaling to a company, it's another huge step, and only companies can do that. We cannot do this upscaling process. We can discuss with companies, we can be part of a team, but the upscaling is a business problem. We can do so much in laboratory scale up to maybe some pilot scale. We can melt here like seven kilograms of glass in one furnace and make a piece like this, 30 by 30 centimeters, and that's the maximum we can do here, in one by one, not in a continuous process. Anyway, my message to you is that, and especially Maziar, Mina, and uh, Deborah that are currently developing glass ceramics from here to here. You have to think in all these steps. Just to give you some examples of commercial glass ceramics, their composition. This is all with beta quartz solid solutions. This is a lithium alumina silicate kind of materials. Lithium alumina silicate with Many other elements, some are fining agents, others are just there to make melting easy, others to improve a little bit the chemical durability, I don't know. But the, the intended phase is beta quartz, because beta quartz solid solution is very low thermal expansion. So different companies like Corning, Schott, Nippon Electric Glass, Nippon Electric Glass and Schott, they have different materials. And just to give you an idea how complicated these compositions are, look, silica, alumina, lithium oxide, magnesium oxide, zinc oxide, sodium, potassium, barium. These are the nucleating agents for this particular kind of phase, a mixture of titania and zirconia, and then fining agent arsenic oxide, and then for some color. You want to impart some color depending on the market, so you can use iron, copper, chromium, uh, manganese, nickel, you know, PPM level to give some color. In each company has a somewhat different composition, you know. This is widely different, you see. This one has about 70% of silica, this one by zero dur by shot, this is used in telescope mirrors, has only 55% of silica, but a lot of alumina. 25% of alumina, this, believe me, is a lot of alumina. And then it has also zirconia, so I bet these glasses are very difficult to make and melt 
See, the level of alumina is very, very high, from 20 to, from 20 to 25, and the level of zirconia from 2 to 3 or so. These are difficult glass. They are very, very viscous. This is one type of glass ceramic containing beta quartz solid solution produced by different companies. And this type of glass ceramic has been very successful. They rely on zero thermal expansion coefficient. Some of the properties. Let's compare the properties of some of these materials with the properties of soda lime silica glass. Like, take the average four-point painting strength. For a soda lime silica glass, the typical average is 40 megapascal. Look at the glass ceramics, 140, 110, 80. So this is at least twice to three times. This is 200 to 300 percent stronger. It's a lot. They're normally harder. The elastic modulus, you know, the glass is 70, the glass ceramic 90, 95, 92, so significantly higher. And the key difference is here. This is the key difference. Thermal expansion coefficient, 110 to the minus 7. Look at the thermal expansion coefficient of this material here. Minus 3, 0, 0 in a certain temperature range, normally from 0 to 5, 600 degrees Celsius, zero thermal expansion coefficient. The glass can be used up to a maximum of 500 degrees Celsius, because Tg is 550. So at 500, after some time, it will flow. It will flow, even below Tg. You know that it will relax and flow. So this is the maximum. You know, if you go a little bit higher, it will flow with time. The, the glass ceramics are more, say, refractory. It can go up to 700 because they also have a glass phase. So glass ceramics also flow with time because of the glass phase flows. Here is a huge difference. Critical thermal shock resistance of a typical glass. This is very useful for you. Never, never give a thermal shock higher than 60 or 70 degrees Celsius. You break. A, a, a soda lime silica glass, such as this one, will break. If you, if you put, you know, like uh, uh, boiling water here and cool it down, it will break. But these glass ceramics can stand up to 800 degrees Celsius of thermal shock. Just because their thermal expansion coefficient is very slow, very small. Okay, uh, how can we then play games with the chemical composition, the nucleating agents, and the thermal treatments to design different microstructures. Uh, there's a number, a number, huge number of crystals. They can be ellipsoidal, they can be square, they can be spherulitic-like, you name it. They can be hexagonal, they can be acicular. That depends on the property you're looking for. You look for shapes which will favor the properties you're, you're looking for. For instance, if you're searching for really tough glass ceramics, you try to find crystal phases that have house of cards type of microstructure or a secular a secular types of microstructures to deflect cracks and so on. Um, here are some examples of my favorite
type of microstructures. And I'd like to call your attention to this one here. And this particular spherul, this is a spherulitic type of microstructure that leads to self-cracking. You see cracking, propagating from this crystal. So depending on the difference between the thermal expansion coefficients of the crystal phase and of the glass phase, sometimes these residual stresses are so high that cracks self-propagate. This is undesirable, of course. But glass ceramics is design is not easy. That's what I'm trying to say. It's not just crystallizing some crystal phase inside a glass phase. Sometimes you end up with bad properties. You have to take into account uh, several uh, features of the, of the materials to end up with interesting properties. Sometimes you can even force texture. You see in this case here, like doing an exercise, very interesting exercise, to mimic bone. Now, bones are anisotropic. They're, they're stronger in one direction than in the other. So in this case, we are playing games trying to make the crystals to align in a certain direction to purposely to produce anisotropic glass ceramics. This is textured crystals in a bioactive glass. Sometimes you can produce nano-sized crystals. Uh, this is hard to read, but this is 100 nanometers. So these crystals have like, this is an electron um, micrograph um, photo. Uh, you can produce a very, very, very high number of nano-sized crystals, 50 nanometer sized crystals or so depending on the nucleation ability of certain matrices. This is Fresnoid. Other interesting micrographs resembling hummingbirds. This is a photo by our visitor Vladimir Folkin, who is uh, one of the members of the TC7, a great expert on nucleation crystallization. And then if you are interested, there is a book called Crystals in Glass. I think I know the author. You're familiar to me, this name. And uh, where this author has collected 50, 50 selected micrographs, which are not only beautiful, but they show some kind of physical phenomenon uh, regarding crystallization of glasses, crystals in glass. A hidden beauty. Hidden because you can only observe most of these micrographs under a microscope, so they're hidden. To the naked eye, they're hidden. All right, so the traditional processing of glass ceramic involves making a glass. First step, you have to make a good glass. Conform and shape the glass. So you need to produce an article. And then it's cooled down and he heated somewhat above the glass transition temperature. And then even a third step, you can even heat the glass to a higher temperature to proceed with crystal growth. One key step is to find a proper nucleating agent. And here is a problem, which is still open to research. What's the best nucleating agent for your particular glass ceramics? We don't know, unless somebody else has studied that type of glass ceramic. OK, they have tested several and found one. But if you are developing a brand new glass ceramic, you don't know. There's no 
rule of thumb so far as to why certain nucleating agents work better than others. So people have tried zirconia, titania, P205, chromia, F203, noble metals in certain fluorides in different types of glass ceramics. But like I can tell you one, for lithium silicate type of glass ceramics, P205 is a very good nucleating agent. But other materials do not work. For the lithium alumina silicate, ZRO2 and TiO2 are good nucleating agents. The other do not work. So it's still not clear why certain elements or oxides are better than others. And this is a matter of try and error. Yes, try and error so far. Of course, you start always with one of these because they work for some other systems. You hope that they work for your particular system, but sometimes none of these works. Okay, we have seen a lot of times this plot, so it's important to know the nucleation rates and growth rates to be able to design your thermal treatment. Que horas são? What time is it, please? 11.5. Well, I'm going to uh, diverge a little bit and talk about surface nucleation. So far, we are talking about how to induce internal nucleation in some materials to produce a volume crystallized glass ceramic. But most glasses only nucleate on the surface. That's interesting. Almost all glasses, if you heat them up, they will nucleate from defects on the surface, from impurities, whatever. So that's an idea. If you don't find a nucleating agent, you can always make a glass, grind the glass, insert the glass in some proper mold, and heat it up. So there'll be sintering of the glass particles by viscous flow. And if you're lucky and if you can control, nucleation is starting from the surface of the particles without the need of using a nucleating agent. In this case, you end up with a sintered glass ceramic, uh, mimicking the normal sintering process that it's used in ceramics. So they can be produced by concurrent, it has to be concurrent sintering crystallization of glass particle compacts. And they start at the glass surface. The problem is that there is always some residual porosity. In the other route, sometimes porosity appear, but not always. You can easily produce a glass ceramic like this one with zero porosity. But by the sintering route, as for in the common ceramics, there is some residual porosity, which impairs some properties. You know, it's not good for most properties. But nevertheless, people have made sintered glass ceramics and they produce like marble-like floor and wall tiles, solder glasses, frit solder glasses for a ceiling multi-layer substrates, and bioactive scaffolds, bioactive <clears throat> glass ceramic scaffolds produced by sintering with concurrent crystallization. The idea is to let the crystallization process to take place during, during the sintering step, not after. If you sinter the material, you lose all the surfaces, then there will be no crystallization. It has to take place concurrently. And this is the 
complicated part. But I like this picture because this was done by two former students of mine, Vivi Oliveira and Rafa Reis. They were working on sintering crystallization. And we had spheres. You see here two spherical particles of a diopside glass. So two spherical particles. You can see clearly in this micrograph that a neck is being formed. So the particles are sintering. But crystals are forming on the surface. Crystals are forming on this. This is the, what we call sintering with concurrent crystallization. And the whole idea is uh, schematically shown here. Like we have a glass. This is a glass. Particles. They are just stuck together in some mode. We start to heat. In this particular case, it's a calcium aluminum silicate glass at about 850 degrees Celsius. They start to sinter by viscous flow. But then, before this interface disappear, because in the end they will disappear, there is nucleation at the interface. And you let the crystals grow a little bit. So they grow a little bit from the interfaces. So in the end, we come up with a material which looks like granite, for instance. They are partially crystallized. And each, each surface acts as a nucleation site. There are several references. I'm not going to go through all these references, but if you use the name Prado, Zanotto, and Miller, you see several, several of our papers which were published in the 2001, 2001, 2002, 2003, 2008. Between 2001 and 2010, we have published a lot of papers on, on this area, coming up with a model to be able to, which allows you to predict the rates of sintering in surface crystallization. I'm not going to review our model today, because it will take a whole class to review. So I'm going to skip a few transparencies and show the developed products. But the model is very useful, because by knowing the number of sites, the crystal growth rates, and the viscosity of the systems, we can, in a computer, simulate the thermal treatments necessary to produce sintered glass ceramics. So this is the model, but I'm, I'm going to skip the model. The, the final thing is we can predict like the density of the material, the overall density versus time at different temperatures. The, the density is one when the material is fully, fully sintered. Fully sintered being the, dense, the, the relative density is one. When it has pores, the relative density is, is less than one. So here, for a particular system of soda, lime, silica, glass spheres, we have predicted, see? We have measured. These are measured values in the predictions of our model. You know, the measured values at different temperatures in the predictions of our model. So you can use the model to predict the sintering kinetics at different temperatures. And you can notice here that they never reach one. This is exactly the residual porosity, a few percent residual porosity for most glasses which crystallize from the surface, you cannot reach 100% density because the crystals impede. They, they impair the sintering. That's why they compete and they impair. In the end, you have some residual porosity. But for some uses, like if you're producing artificial granite, 
You can have some residual porosity. It's no big problem. All granites have residual porosity anyway. Or if you're producing a scaffold, bioactive scaffold, they have to be porous anyway. Scaffolds have 70 to 80 percent in the volume of porosity. They are porous materials, so there is no problem of using this route. Anyway, using this technique, it's possible to produce very, very nice types of construction materials, even with rounded shapes. These are all commercial sintered glass ceramics materials with any color. That's the beauty about these artificial stones. Any color. You want it brown, green, red, purple, white. You can do it. And they have a very high commercial success. You know, even certain parts of constructions, you know, floor tiles, wall tiles, uh, you name it. This is in Sao Paulo, the JK Shopping Center, brand new shopping center in Sao Paulo, uh, 250 kilometers from here. It's very, very nice. I have been there. Uh, completely white. The architects wanted a completely white facade, and they did it with uh, one of these glass ceramics. But if you look at the catalogs of, of companies, they have all sorts of shapes, colors, shades, you name it. Uh, an interesting type that was produced by one of our colleagues here, Professor Pandolfelli, which is really interesting, is to crystallize the glass phase in refractories. You know, refractory materials are meant to be refractory. They, they do not have to flow at high temperatures, but they also have a residual glass phase. It's very, very hard to avoid the formation of a small percentage of glass phase when you sinter a ceramic. What they did, they found some addictives, some nucleating agents that, if you look at these original materials, this original material, the elastic modulus, is about 80 gigapascal as a function of temperature. It went up to 1,000, came back, you know, 78, 80 megapas uh, gigapascal. Now, the red material is a material, the same residual glass phase with some additions. Well, it went up and then crystallized. So the elastic modulus went up to 170 or so. This is a huge increase in the elastic modulus from about 80, you know, to more than two times increase in the elastic modulus. This is 100% or more by crystallizing the residual glass phase. So this is a kind of, on purpose, so this is a glass ceramic inside the refractory. The original glass phase became a glass ceramic. In this, believe this or not, my PhD thesis 35 years ago or so, uh, that I started to work on how to crystallize the glass phase of grinding wheels. You know, these grinding wheels, which are produced to grind hard materials, they have a glass phase. And my project was to crystallize the glass phase. It did not work well, so I gave up, and after two or three months, I decided that it was going to take a long time because the composition was very complicated. I decided to do some other, more fundamental work. But I worked on this type of idea 35 years ago, without success, I should say, here. Anyway, hot area, bioactive glass ceramics. This is a, many people in the world 
working with bioactive glass ceramics. And as I mentioned before, scaffolds, you know, some structures that allow bone growth inside them, but they're very weak. So one idea is to make a scaffold out of glass or bioactive glass, but they're very, very weak. And then you crystallize this material because they have a lot of surface. There is no need to add nucleating agents and then get produces stronger, tougher and stronger scaffolds. Murilo Crovazzi, one of my youngest colleagues here, is working in this field in our lab. Um, several bioactive glass ceramics have been developed along the years. There are two very famous cerebone commercial materials and bioverite, and other commercial materials are available. And then the <clears throat> Bioactive class B1, B2. This is our own glass ceramic called biosilicate A2. There, our is much more bioactive than the other two. In other words, they react faster when you implant these materials in the bone. They bond faster to bone or cartilage faster than the other two <coughs> glass ceramics. This has a very good machinability. This one has a very low. Ours have an average machinability. Machinability is very important because the medical doctor, when he is doing a surgery, he wants to cut a little bit or drill a hole to adapt to the size of the patient. So machinability is an important property. The density, the lower the better. The ideal density is equal to the density of bone. But uh, these materials are very dense. So like if you implant, you don't want your leg you know, to be extremely heavy you know, if you have a, a piece of these materials inside. So you want it to be as light as bone. But well, ours has at least a better, a smaller density than the competing. Uh, mechanical properties. Ours compete with cerebone about the same, 200 megapascal, three point, this is three point bending strength. That's a good, fair enough strength. The last modulus, you also want the last modulus of your material to be similar to the last modulus of bone. You do not want a high last modulus because of stress shielding problems. So the lower, the better. And of course, K1C, the toughness. So this is where our glass ceramics uh, is behind uh, this cerebone. Uh, the toughness of our glass ceramic is not very high. It's about one. This is about two. And also, it's low crack growth. This is one, Mina, that you have to uh, measure in your dental glass ceramic. She is working a dental type of glass ceramic. It's low crack rows for static fatigue. The slower, the better. And most of these glass ceramics do not have their slow crack growth properties yet evaluated. It's very important to evaluate for all types of glass ceramics, slow crack growth or stress corrosion crack or static fatigue. Anyway, I'm just showing that uh, the biosilicate, the glass ceramic developed here, has many good properties except for K1C. The idea is still to further improve K1C, ideally to about three, three and a half. This is the goal. If you have any ideas on how to improve the K1C of a bioglass ceramic, this is where we want to go. Um, so th this is the microstructure of our biosilicate. You know, 15% volume fraction crystallized, 34% volume fraction crystallized, and here, 95% volume fraction crystallized. So you can vary the volume fraction crystallized. In this particular case, keeping the grain size constant and um, 
this is how the properties evolve. You know, flexural four point, this is four point banding strength, as a function of the volume fraction crystallized for a constant grain size, because the grain size also plays an important role in mechanical properties. In this case, we found that the bioglass was here, and the best material had about this strength here, about 210, so three times higher than the bending strength of the original uh, bioactive glass. So this is the kind of work that it took us about three years to develop. This is Oscar Spito thesis, working jointly with Professor Larry Hench, I should mention, the inventor of bioglass. Professor Hench came here many years ago, and he wanted to increase the strength of his bioglass. And this is the first result that we had after three years of work. It was Oscar's thesis, actually. Uh, we managed then to develop this material, which in the end we call the biosilicate. We had uh, several products developed, like these middle rear bones. These middle rear bones are made of our biosilicate. And the interesting result is that we had clinical tests done at the medical school in Ribeirão Preto. Uh, we had 30 patients. They could not hear anything. After surgery, we implanted in their ears these materials produced here in this lab. 24 recovered their hearing ability. 24 out of 30 is a huge success. Now we have to do more tests before launching this product in the market. It's necessary to do more in humans. This is very complex to do. But this is the first result. 24 out of 30 recover their hearing ability. The other six did not recover because they had post-operation post problems, you know, infections and things like that that happen in hospitals. Another case is for treating Denting hypersensitivity, denting hypersensitivity. You know, these are the micrographs, electromicrographs of denting tubules. They, they become exposed, and then we develop denting hypersensitivity, very acute pain when you drink something cold or hot. Now, if you make a powder of this one to five microns, and brush the powder of this bioactive material, it will react with saliva and obliterate the tubules. So denting hypersensitivity is cured. 100% success, 100% success. Everybody's cured. You may develop later on another teeth made tooth may develop denting hypersensitivity, but we can treat all this hypersensitivity with the bioactive material. We have done clini clinical trials with 160 patients, and we cured them all. Well, well, there are some processing techniques you know, this is the traditional technique, melting, shaping, nucleation, growth, glass, ceramic. Traditional techniques. We also have some more sophisticated techniques, like you can crystallize a material using laser. And this is a glass ceramic, yes, because it's crystallized on purpose, for instance, to build up an optical circuit. You want to build an optical circuit instead of an electronic circuit, which will be much, much faster, and there are people working in this field. So we can produce single crystals by moving up a laser at the proper wavelength, at the proper speed. We can crystallize materials 
by using laser radiation, like we show here in this, in this figure. And this is for fun, you can produce very intricate shapes. And uh, if you dope these materials with, with rare earths, you can also produce second harmonic generation. Second harmonic generation. In other words, you can like incite with um, infrared light and produce visible light. Light. This is second harmonic generation, up conversion uh, of light in these materials. Or you can use CO2 lasers, normal CO2 lasers. You, you see an example which we did here in São Carlos. Uh, uh, then any CO2 lasers work at about 10 microns. So any silicate glass will absorb radiation at 10 microns, and then we crystallize with a CO2 laser with no problems. Um, and then I'm almost finishing. I'd like to show to you the so-called photothermal refractive glass, which are glasses that have a very small volume fraction crystallized, less than 1% of nanocrystals, and they are intended to refract light. See? Let me move so you can see better. These are very, very sophisticated materials that we have helped a company in the USA called OptiGrade to improve a little bit. They, they had developed themselves the material, but to improve uh, the quality of these materials. And the whole idea is not only to crystallize, but the crystals themselves are arranged in some particular organized fashion. So we have a glass matrix, very small crystals, so they don't scatter light. But each crystal is at a certain distance from the other crystal, which is at a certain distance from the other crystal. This is called a metamaterial. This is a meta material, very high tech. You know, if you have seen all the other glass ceramics, in all the other glass ceramics, the crystals are randomly oriented. If you look at the other microstructures, each crystal is crystalline. It has a atomic order, but they are randomly oriented. Here, the crystals are aligned. And with, by doing that, if you match this spacing with the wavelength of visible light, we can produce that kind of phenomenon. And they are used uh, as Bragg gratings, Bragg gratings for lasers, for high-power high lasers. So most high-power high lasers have one of, or more of these pieces inside. They sell for $5,000 each one of these pieces here, or $20,000 for a larger piece. So they're very high-tech materials, but they're glass ceramics. The, the properties, their special properties, rely on the fact that, um, that um, there is a glass phase and there is a crystal phase inside. I forgot to show you, but let me show you before I, we finish, an artificial iliac bone. This is uh, one of the biomaterials that I was talking about. And they have sold about 100,000 patients, 100,000 patients in Japan mostly, have one of these pieces inserted in them. 
It's a part of the iliac bone here. We are also developing in our group some other types, some other types of glass ceramics for eye replacement, for eye implants. Okay, I think we are about to finish, and let me give you a summary of everything. Forming. Articles of any shape can be made by any glass processing method that already exists or may be invented. So this is a great advantage of glass ceramics. We use glass forming techniques, very fast and efficient. Thermal treatment can be none. For instance, crystallization induced during the cooling path. You can, in principle, design a certain cooling path where nucleation growth takes place. This is difficult to do, but not impossible. Or one step or several steps. Microstructure can be micro, can be nano, can be centimeter, can be high volume fraction, low volume fraction, texture, known texture, one phase, more than one phase, you name it. Micro or nano structure. Thermal treatment. Ah, oh, thermal properties. Controlled thermal expansion, negative zero, highly positive, uh, stable, non-stable, low thermal conductivity. There are interesting thermal, thermal properties that can be achieved with glass ceramics. Mechanical properties, they're in general much higher strength and toughness than the parent glasses. They're also hard and they have a higher elastic modulus. So if you need some applications regarding high strength, high toughness, harder, higher elastic modulus, this is the way to go. For instance, in armor materials. Chemical may be resorbable, like bioactive materials, they are resorbable or extremely durable, depending on the chemical composition. May be inert or bioactive, may have electrical and magnetic properties, they may be translucent or opaque or palescent, fluorescent, they can suffer photoinduction nucleation, such as in this case here of PTR glass. Uh, colorless or colored. Plenty is already known about glass ceramic technology, but many challenges and opportunities in development are ahead. And they are the search for new compositions. And there are many, many, many to try. Other and more potent nucleating agents, new or improved crystallization processes, can be microwaves, can be laser, can be ultrasound, I don't know, new processes. Deeper understanding and control of photothermal induced nucleation, this is photothermal induced nucleation. Development of harder, stiffer, stronger and tougher glass ceramics is always a good Think transparent glass ceramics with increased transparency, more and more transparent, more ionic conducting, and many others. So unexpected applications will probably surface that require a combination of properties. This is the key word here, combination of properties. For all this, I think Glass ceramics have indeed a very bright future. And that's why we are still interested in this field. We have been working for many, many years with the glass ceramics, but I still think all the uh, plots that we have shown, number of papers, number of patents, number of people becoming more and more interested is a hot field, in my opinion. Any questions? 
no questions today. This is the last class. Everybody's tired. So thank you very much and see you next time. Bye-bye.